focus on cloud, location, data center, industry, trends, the dynamic market. Well, I'm David Liggett with Data Center Hawk, and I am very excited to be joined by Martin Peck, Executive Vice President with Lincoln Rackhouse, and Bob Painter, President of Ascent. Gentlemen, good to see you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. This is one, and I say this in a lot of these, but this is one of like the most fun and invigorating things I get to do, which is sit with leaders in the data center industry and talk about uh, what's happening and where they see the market going. Um, and so before we jump into that, I'd love to know, uh, and Martin, we'll start with you, but how on earth did you get into the data center industry? Thanks. Um, one of the least fun and invigorating things that I do is talk about myself. So I'll make this fairly quick and, <laughs> and, and we'll move on. I am a, I'm a, a longtime commercial real estate guy and I've had a remarkable career, not for any personal achievements, but for the, uh, the companies I've worked with and the people I've become friends with and each stop along the way. I started uh, with the Gerald Hines organization as a young leasing agent and, um, and then went to evolve through the Trammell Pro organization for the majority of my career. And now I'm, um, I'm with Lincoln Property Company. Um, we got in the data center space oh, over 20 years ago when a group of us at, uh, at Trammell Pro Company really started to talk about a lot of the, the technology uh, business that was uh, the growth that was taking place in, in Northern California. And we had some pro teammates um, talk to us in, in Texas at our headquarters about getting into this space. We, we hired a gentleman named uh, Howard Horowitz on the East Coast. And so we uh, built a team, uh, a guy named Brent Burnett in Dallas. Uh, was an integral part of the team. And, and uh, we began just kind of talking about what, it's, what is this we're getting into and that business grew over time. And, and I think we're really proud of what we grew from those days at Trammell Pro and, uh, and where each of those key, uh, those key teammates, uh, where they ended up within the data center uh, space. And, um, and now, now it, you know, 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, we founded Lincoln Rackhouse and it's, uh, it's been quite a run. And, and now that uh, we've got uh, joined hands with my new partner, Bob, Painter and his team, and I sent the uh, just very excited about what's what lies ahead. Right on. Uh, thank you, Martin. And, you know, I had the privilege, obviously, of when I was at CBRE getting to work alongside Brant Burnett for a number of years. And, um, man, loved every minute of that. He is such a great guy and a class act and, and uh, does great work. Uh, Bob, let's talk about your background. How did you find your way in the data center industry? Interesting enough, my whole family, my two sisters are engineers. My dad, not by degree, but was probably most ingen you know, ingenious person I knew. Uh, got into engineering at Mizzou and uh, came out of there not knowing what I wanted to do and uh, worked at a nuclear plant in design. Uh, not knowing, since I wasn't the most qualified, they put me in to run power circuits in the data center of the nuclear plant, which... I didn't know what a data center was. I probably didn't know what a UPS was at the time. So, um, three years later, you know, they're working there. I went and transferred uh, from the utility here in uh, Missouri to Ameren and worked in the district office, which was, well, the power quality, construction, commercial development, relocations, all the stuff that sort of touches any from anything from developments to data centers to power quality. Um, Fast forward, I got an MBA, you know, said, hey, I need to, you know, grow my, you know, expand my horizons, get out and travel. And I met Phil Horse, Horseman on the project you know, 22 years ago, and uh, he recruited me with a, a set of uh, golf clubs, and uh, <laughs> I came over to work for him. Um, we had, he had one uh, contract, operational contract for $650,000, and I was probably the fifth or sixth person hire first engineer um, on the team and, uh, and that was 1999 so right then the world was about to flip upside down with the dot dot bomb and all that kind of stuff so we had uh, we morphed and over time you know came from an operational company to a project management company to 
Phil started developments and we grew grew the business to where where it is today, 22 years later. So that's great. Hey, hey, as this interview moves forward, your audience will quickly realize that I was in the half of the class that made Bob's half of the class possible. <laughs> that's good. I love it. Well, I was actually going to say, you know, two very interesting things that I just pulled from what you all said. You know, number one, it's it's very unique, in my opinion, today to see people that have had such strong and long tenures uh, with organizations. I think that says a lot about the people as well as the organization and the way it values people that they'll be there for that long and grow. And um, so that's one thing that's really interesting. The other thing is just the value of relationships. You know, so much of our world today has been rocked over the last couple of years by coronavirus and the pandemic. And it just continues, in my opinion, to, to I've been reminded of how important relationships are. You know, Martin, just hearing your perspective on how you know, the people that you've worked with over time and and Bob, your relationship with with Phil and, and the relationships that can be formed over golf clubs and on a golf course. Um, let's talk about the announcement that was made, you know, a few weeks ago. Um, and Martin, maybe I'll have you start and, and Bob um, certainly comment. But you know, what was it that you felt like from a Lincoln Rackhouse perspective that, you know, it made sense to move forward with, you know, this ownership type of purchase? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to. So really, from Lincoln's point of view, over the last um, six years, I would say we have um, we built a portfolio of owned assets within Lincoln Rackhouse, mainly through um, through sell leaseback transactions through enterprise corporate owners, whereby, you know, many corporations, probably especially after 9-11, originally began a journey of uh, protecting their own assets by building um, data centers and owning data centers and operating data centers. And as time has, has uh, evolved within our industry, especially as it began to tilt towards hyperscalers, for example, you know, these enterprise um, organizations realize that they don't need to own real estate or own data centers or operate data centers. They, want, may, they may want to protect their most secret secrets in their own data center space, but there's many at, uh, aspects of their platforms that they can outsource to others, to, to um, you know, IBM or AWS or whomever. So um, we began, we began a, a journey of acquiring assets and, and leasing those back to those companies and then putting those assets back into, uh, in some cases, we would convert them from single tenant use buildings to multi-tenant use buildings. And we would put those back in play with, um, well, for other, for other operators or other tenants to, to take that space as, as uh, obviously that, that enterprise business has changed dramatically with, uh, with the continued growth of the cloud. And, um, we have uh, our business began to focus more on build a suit or ground up um, site development. And uh, when we had the opportunity to learn about Ascent, and um, we, we, we acquired Ascent, made a significant investment in Ascent with a partner, Stone Point Capital. Um, we um, felt that it would be to our advantage to really have under under one organization the full suite of design engineering construction and facilities management especially as we move uh, forward with the next phase of our business and um, so that's 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 basically it and then we can if you want we can talk later about you know what i saw personally when i first met bob and his team and uh, and what that meant to me yeah you bet and bob what from your perspective what was that like to be you know, from a sense and um, obviously having that type of design and construction background, um, you know, to, to kind of now be joining Lincoln and what's that, what was that like for you? It, it was a, it was a long process, but it was a good process. Um, the, uh, and that was, that was just as much, that was us as well. Cause we're, we we're trying to figure out what was best for us. Uh, we were very employee focused on our your core our team um, most of the core team has been working together for almost eight to ten years so it's uh, you know the value toward the employee was important toward the transaction um, you know that, there is no movement on our people and we get to you know grow within the Lincoln property company 
and you know stone point you know introductions and that aspect of it um, it's going to open up a bunch of doors for operational business and our design and construction business um, we've grown the operational businesses has been sort of our strong point over the past five years and uh, and, you know, along with that, the construction work for our operational uh, clients just sort of gro grows with that. And uh, um, the more introductions we can get, more more warmer leads and more uh, more more ac activity, we can just grow that pipeline. So it's pretty exciting. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll just Mark I'll just tag on to that if I could. It, it was uh, it was important. It was equally important to us, and certainly as it was to Bob and and Phil and their team that uh, no one would lose a job during this, during this um, transition. Uh, as I began to um, oversee the due diligence of our two organizations as we looked into Ascent and would come up uh, to St. Louis and, and meet the team, you know, it, I was pretty overwhelmed with what Bob touched on it. He said eight to 10 years. In many cases, it's 12 to 20 years of, of teamwork together and uh, couple that with the with just the, the Midwestern values that, that this this group of teammates has, man, I, I knew that we were, I knew that we were onto something, and, and this was something that, that we should do, and I'm I'm so thankful that it, it's come about. Well, it's certainly a time that, at least from our perspective at Data Center Hawk, you know, to be uh, growing and adding additional services to the offering, I think, is more valuable today than ever, you know, related to the way the data center users are expecting uh, to grow and looking for flexibility. And so to have that type of, of bench and, and team that you can put in front of people makes a lot of sense. Talk, let's talk about the market today because it's changed significantly over the last five to 10 years. Um, and, and I think Martin, you know, your standpoint, at, as you all have acquired facilities, they traditionally, you know, with the Lincoln Rack House portfolio, they traditionally were, you know, single tenant, um, you know, sale lease backs, you're, you know, at times your enterprise user. Um, and, and so that's certainly some of the things that and demand that we've seen growing and changing in the market. We've also seen uh, a lot of hyperscale growth, you know, the, these top 20 companies around the world um, growing in, in very big footprints. But I'd love both Martin, your and Bob's perspective on, you know, those type of companies and what their needs are today. Yeah, so, um you know, believe me, this is um, this is editorial. Anybody out there can disagree with what I'm saying, but um, you know, the hyperscalers seem to want to self-perform many of their uh, the functions that 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 others uh, are trying to do on their behalf. Their business is at such a fevered pace right now. I think that there's opportunities for for several um, avenues within our our data center space to assist those companies. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, the, the, the enterprise tenants that used to um, have, have operate their facilities on their own now are customers of the hyperscalers. Um, mm -hmm. But yet, as the cloud continues to grow and as, as the, the trends of our industry, especially coming out of COVID, as it relates to network and bandwidth and the edge, you know, the opportunity is just going to be boundless for us to, to expand into not only new ge geographies, but also new sectors. Um, of, of industry. I mean, healthcare is just one that in, in traditionally healthcare tends to lag behind from a technology point of view. And we just see that as a, as a tremendous, as a tremendous platform that we're going to, to develop a strategy to, to penetrate. And Bob, from your standpoint, how do you see like the design construction uh, differences with, you know, the enterprise users today and, and hyperscale users? What are some of the differences you see between those two? One, it's, it's obviously scale, you know, and, and the aspects of the hyperscalers. It's not, it's not the, it's not 20 acres. It's 200 acres. It's you know 500 acres. It's not 10 megawatts now. It's 50, 100, 200 megawatts. Right. It's just um, most of our our business is um, you know niche projects that could be end of life kind of stuff for our operational clients. Um, we we obviously chase new new construction as well um, from, but from the from the site operation side I mean the outsourcing of the resources getting out of the data center operations business um, you know utilizing our tools and platform to better you know operate their and you know you know make their facilities more efficient and 
and resilient uh, to downtime and that aspect of it. I think uh, I think that's that's been proven even through COVID with the processes and procedures we're able to sort of maintain and operate all our facilities with no no downtime and and that's a it's a feather to you know our, my team and the, all the folks on the ground. Um, they did and they were there. They never left. So uh, you know the 120 people that we have for the you know were. Some were sort of furloughed to sort of stay away, so we didn't we did because we didn't know what we didn't know. <laughs> and yeah. uh, but you know our customers were like thanking us, you know, left and right, appreciate what you did and that kind of stuff. So and truly, yeah, the facility the facility is probably more safer being there because no one else was there. So. Sure, the industry has has you know evolved so 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 quickly and so far beyond just traditional services like you know, facilities management services and such. There's there's uh, there's technology aspects that are going to to take more and more control of how we monitor these situations and all the way down to the vendors. And Ascent has developed some pretty interesting um, technology tools, one in particular that we call Navigator, that uh, we think is a game changer. And, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I'm excited about learning more and more about because every time I learn a little bit more about it, I get more excited about um, its application and what we're going to try to do. Sure. sure. Yeah, Bob, you mentioned the the value of like the, the platform that um, Ascent has created and and how users really find that value. Talk a little bit more about that. Like what what have you seen users find really valuable with that and how has that benefited, you know, some of your customers? Well, I mean, she probably eight to 10 years ago, we were very people driven oriented, not a process workflow oriented company. And, you know, you could see that in data quality, you know, as it relates to what we could produce and produce quickly. Um, six, about six years ago, we revamped our whole entire platform, just stripped it down and redid it and built it into, you know, just how we do business. We had to know every step of the way where the work was, you know, what the status of it was, our customer needed to know, it needed to be transparent, it needed to be, you know, you know, very good data. You can't get perfect with everything because people are still involved, but, uh, and you got to be able to report on it. Um, and, you know, just call it the easy button, you know, we can put an easy button on our stuff and you can download it and zip it up and you can have all your documents you know, at, at, you know, so there's no risk to you that we're going to keep your information and that aspect. Sure. Of it. And, uh, uh, that that's it's it's work. It's working. It's uh, it's it's proven and it uh, has has uh, stick. It sticks because uh, you know just doing it on spreadsheets and just doing it you know via email and that aspect of it. It's you know that's that's not not productive. So and yeah. we're trying to grow it. There's a lot of there's a lot of aspects of Diving into you know more analytics, to, you know, to asset condition reports and into life that we're sort of growing, uh, you know, being more, uh, you know, I'd say get rid of the paper, you know, online sure. mops and that kind of stuff to make sure, you know, this platform I can get to an invoice, a field service report, or a mop within three clicks for any piece of work on any piece of asset that we manage of the you know 800 plus properties we have. So it's uh, it's pretty it's pretty exciting that I mean our clients use it because it has very you know resilient reporting details around finances and that aspect of it you know it's it has a it touches a lot of aspects of each part of the business whether it's uh, the contracting the finances you know the the, the data quality and then the asset health. Um, which all goes into reliability and, you know, be able to report on your successes. So Yeah. And, you know, I, I, at least from my standpoint, I feel like the operational side, you know, has never been as important as it has been over the last, you know, year and a half. And with some of the challenges that uh, operating data centers in the pandemic, you know, created just trying to figure out the new set of rules and all the things that you would need to do, I'm sure, as an organization to make sure that, you know, the, the people could stay uh, in the data center, continue to operate the data center um, as needed. How did, you know, this isn't necessarily a question that we talked about beforehand, but how do you feel like the the pandemic and has impacted the space? Uh, Martin, both from just kind of when you think about the overall like growth and demand 
of the market? Like, how is it impacted? And then, Bob, I'd love to hear from your standpoint, like on the operational side, maybe a challenge of like what you had to do as a leader of a company to, you know, when when everything changed, how did you make sure that you could continue to to move things forward? Yep. Well, certainly from the from the we we still run our equity business. We call it our equity business uh, as Lincoln Rock House from Dallas, and that's our. Uh, investments in acquisitions of and, and leasing of, of data center space that we that we invest in and acquire. Um, you, know, you know, COVID was a hard hard time for leasing. Um, you know, some of the other um, commercial real estate lines that Lincoln Property Company um, um, functions in, they were able to lease space in some cases via Zoom. Well, obviously, you know. Engineering drives so many of the transactions that we all are involved with. And when we were locked down, um, leasing other than uh, other than renewals, new leases were just a thing of the past. And so we just had to accept that and 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 uh, just put that part of our business on the shelf. You know, one one uh, coincidence is we were able to acquire a data center from a U.S. financial institution in West London, and we did did that entire acquisition via Zoom, and which was pretty pretty hmm. remarkable, really, because uh, London was at a time when we were at our worst uh, lockdown, London was worst. They were locked down yeah. even tighter. And so we were able to um, acquire an asset that way. I think COVID has changed uh, how we are going to continue to invest in, in, in data centers and how we're going to continue to, to attempt to lease those. I do think that on the positive side, um, we can dwell on COVID and just it can turn into one giant negative swing thought if we just continue to let it. I do strongly believe that there is uh, pent up demand that is going to pop and you're going to see, especially given, um, given the cost of new construction that continues to mount because of supply chain issues, I do think you're going to see um, uh, empty space on the market. Uh, it's going to be gobbled up because of that Again, pent up demand. I knock on everything in those hopes. Sure. <laughs> Bob, from your standpoint, what was it like leading an organization in that? And, and what did you feel like y'all did to be successful to make sure that you could keep things moving forward? So we have a 24 by 7 AOC, and most of our back office support and overhead is here in St. Louis. So there's two challenges. One, just the whole main office support that had to chat and do that and for that aspect of it our processes and our workflows and our system enabled us to you know pull those people back and, and manage them if it was just people oriented and they just had to do their job I, I felt like it would have not been very successful because of just the distractions with being at home and all the other kind of you know stuff going on um, now the field guys uh, they still had to be there. I mean, we're covering it as a service or an FTE. Uh, mm -hmm. our, all of our customers were great and flexible with us on how we manage that, but each one was unique in their own of their own rule sets that they were creating, whether it was by state or by the by by just the company. Um, we follow, we tried to follow ours by you know as close as we could to the CDC, but you know we were told we couldn't you know interview some staff at the data center. Uh, because they weren't going to allow any visitors there. Well, how do you hire a person to go work in a data center for them out them seeing the data center? So uh, yeah, um, we had a few workarounds, but that it was okay because I mean you know got to get them staffed because that's what they were wanting us to do. And uh, it's you know it's conflicting with the HR side of things and the operational side of things of you know hey how can you still make it work? while we're, you know, and, and keeping everything up. And there's not a lot of activity because everyone's very hesitant to do much in the data center business, you know, you know, change much because sure, you might not be able to get person out there as quick as you could before or that kind of stuff. Um, and then what it did do, it, been, it made a pent up a bunch of work at the end of, you know, last year, people, you know, sort of said, hey, I got to I got to invest this capital that we had, and so you know we got we got hit with a bunch of project work at the end of the year and 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 throughout this year. So it's uh, it's been a not it's not a good thing by any means, but you know our business uh, model was you know complementary to supporting you know and surviving through you know you know this pandemic. So. 
Yeah. Well, and, you know, I think one of the things that I've gotten excited about was, you know, just through the work that we do in multiple markets, you know, we're, we are hearing of like an increase of requirement activity in, you know, the, I don't know, 10 cabinet to two megawatt range in like multiple markets just across the U.S. and certainly in, in, you know, other like global markets as well. So, Martin, I think that points back to your point before just on the pinup demand Uh, And I I think even on like the enterprise sector, you know, I think there's a number of those requirements last year that took a time out, paused, didn't know what to do because their world changed like overnight. And now they're starting to be a much more clear picture of what, you know, we believe the the world looks like today and and will down the road. And so I think that's one of the reasons we're starting to see some increased um, demand in that sector. And then you you put on top of that the hyperscale growth that's taken place, not just last year, but what we're seeing already in this year. And so it's a really exciting um, and I would say vibrant time to be in this industry. Um, and I think that's what one of the reasons we get so excited about it. And so one of the things I wanted to just kind of ask you all here at the end is, um, you know, what gets you most excited about you know, these next few years in the space, you know, and, and, and I'd love to hear from both of you on this. Like, why do you get excited about being in the data center industry and having this new uh, venture together moving forward? It's really easy for me. I, I'm, I am, uh, you know, when we got into this pursuit of, of ascent, you know, I had some personal hurdles I needed to overcome. One, it was based in St. Louis, and I could never forgive the St. Louis Cardinals because I'm a Rangers fan. <laughs> and we were we were two outs, two strikes twice in the top of the ninth from winning the World Series. And we had a little some issues uh, in, in I the know the pain. But we have an honor check there. I, I was dedicated to my job and skipped game six. I could, could have been at game six, but I was <laughs> did something for Phil up in Chicago that night. So I'm gonna let you yeah, know. See, I wasn't I'm so glad to hear that. In any event, um, I'm most excited about about my teammates at Ascent. This this um, I don't they, they keep but there's many cliches. I'm not going to use them, but but these uh, these folks that are now you know I'm part of are part of me, and I mean that on, on many aspects. They have created um, they have pre- created some tools that are going to they're going to change things. They're going to be market movers, and I'm convinced of it. Uh, if there's anything that I can help with or that we can help with is we're going to help tell the Ascent story in a bigger, broader way. And um, I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how excited I am. There's, there's no other industry trend that I would focus on other than um, this team and, uh, and the hope I have and, and the confidence I have. In uh, I'll take it a couple ways here. You know, just, Growth and successes is, 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 and is in our future. I mean, just with this, this strategic move, just because the opportunity is going to be there for us. Um, uh, secondly, I mean, it's our, it's, our, it's our people. I mean, I've been here 22 years. Jamie, another, he's been here 20, and another part owner, Brad, Polly, he's been here 16 years and worked with mm-hmm. them. And we have a slew of people that started their first jobs here and have grown into, you know, manager positions. So to see that um, happen, I mean, Phil Horseman, you know, luckily hired me and we, you know, all grew this together. And I uh, just want to continue that for the next generation of folks to have opportunities to, you know, same opportunity I was actually got lucky to have. So, Well, it's exciting. Sorry, I'm, a, uh, sorry, I'm, a, I'm about the people, but I am about the people. <laughs> Hey, it's the best thing to be about, uh, you know, and I, I believe that. And I, I think uh, it certainly shows with what you all are doing and, and are building and have built in the past. So, Martin and Bob, thanks so much for giving us the background and uh, talking through what's going to take place here over the next few years. We're excited to see what will happen and certainly wish you nothing but the best. So thanks for taking the time to join us. Thanks, David. Thank you. Appreciate it.